There you go. Am I not on? Am I not? Hello? It's a lonely place up here. <laughs> what did I do? On. Battery. Green. Light. <laughs> it's always my fault. It's good to see everybody tonight. Did Ross already leave? Thank you for leading us in worship tonight, Ross. The, oh, there. If, if you notice, the choir director confiscated all the musicians tonight because it's that time of the year, Thanksgiving holidays, Christmas holidays, and they're getting ready to have that annual blowout. Great, greatest music you'll ever hear. So they've been at it now for weeks and weeks practicing. We already have a Christmas tree up. I see that uh, Karen made it a little lighter and brighter around here. Are you ready for the holidays? No? Okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I could mention Thanksgiving. You know, Thanksgiving week, we always switch Wednesday night to Tuesday. And I don't know what the numbers of the dates are, but the Tuesday before Thanksgiving... It's going to be a wonderful service. Uh, uh, Pastor Jason's working on that. We're going to be actually in the sanctuary because we have a, a bluegrass band. It'll be some bluegrass music and uh, some amazing testimony scriptures. Uh, it's a family service. We'll all be in there together, uh, preschooler kids, high schooler kids. So bring your families. We'll have communion together as a family. Uh, so it's going to be a really an awesome night. So if you're in town, haven't left yet, Tuesday night before Thanksgiving, uh, starting at 7 o'clock is the 20th. 22nd. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, so the 22nd in the sanctuary. And then Christmas. And then Christmas. You know, Christmas is, is odd this year. What day is Christmas on? <laughs> Sunday. So w don't freak out. We're doing something really wild. Our Christmas Eve service is going to be on Christmas Eve, Saturday morning. No Sunday morning church. You can do, do Christmas with your kids and all that at home. So Saturday morning, Christmas Eve service. Bump that first service up to 9, and then the second service at 1030. The choir will be there. Again, that will be a communion service. Uh, it's going to be a great day, but Saturday morning. Okay, Cheryl? All right. Saturday morning. It's hard to believe it's that time yeah, of year. It, is. it yeah. flies by. I can't believe another Wednesday night has rolled around. I just got the sweat wiped off from Sunday, <laughs> and here I am again. I had to study today. You see, I'm supposed to just work a half day a week. <laughs> and this is just kind of messing up my sleep, <laughs> napping. Not really. Okay. So you ready for some questions again tonight? Tough questions, uh, timely answers. You can still so send some in if you would like. We talked a few weeks ago about the Trinity uh, and especially the deity of Jesus Christ. So pursuant to that discussion, someone is asking about Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons uh, because, too, I think we didn't talk about that evening. They really present themselves now as mainstream you know, people that do not know, they present themselves as mainstream Christians. So they're asking, how do you explain in short what those two groups believe? Well, you can't. You can't do it in short because they are so diametrically opposed to standard biblical Christian truth until it just takes forever. They, they're wrong in every aspect. First of all, they have another Bible. Any group that has another Bible run from it because they have taken God's word and they have uh, skewed it and uh, tainted it to fit their own doctrines. They're wrong about God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which is the Trinity. They're wrong about the deity of Jesus Christ, um, about salvation, how to be saved. It's a works-based reli uh, religion. Uh, they are wrong about Adam and is it Jehovah's Witnesses where Jesus and Lucifer are brothers? The Mormons? That's all right. Yeah. So in every aspect of those religions, Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness, Witnesses and the Mormons, it's, it's a her, heretical doctrine, and their people are brainwashed because it is a cult. You know, the Jehovah's Witness 
uh, cult has the watchtower, and uh, then the Mormons have the Book of Mormon, and Joseph Smith, and all of those founders who were crazy. A few weeks ago, Sandra and I were in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I was just astonished. There is a, it's a cult city. They own the banks, they own the malls, they own the schools, uh, they own the government, and people just kind of walk around like zombies out there. It's a, uh, so to, to do it in short, I cannot do it. I can only tell you that if any religious group has another Bible, run. And I think what uh, some people get confused about out there, but also in the church, is people say, well, they are moral yes. people because I think both groups live very moral lives, and you, you address that every week. Well, that's what they stress. Yes. So um, people say that all the time. They will say, well, my aunt was one of the greatest moral Christian women I know of, you're telling me she was in a cult. Well, yeah. You know, Seventh-day Adventism is a cult because they rely on the law. You've got to keep the Old Testament law. Any, any group that says you have to go back to the Old Testament and keep the Old Testament laws is a cult. And uh, we have people who say, but why shouldn't we keep the Sabbath? because the Sabbath is for Israel, you see. When Jesus rose from the dead, he rose on the first day of the week, Sunday. When the disciples and the, uh, the apostles did anything of major importance, they did it on Sunday. Uh, when John the Revelator received the revelation of Jesus Christ, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So the Christian church is not bound to keep any particular day. We are bound to keep all the days. Every day is a Sabbath unto the Lord. And one of the warnings that Paul issued to the Colossians was, don't let anybody put you back in bondage, whether it's feast days or holy days or Sabbaths. Don't let anybody tell you that you have to do certain things, and keep rules to be a child of God. Uh, folks, we are under a different uh, guideline. We are a different power. Our, our Christian life is not a set of rules. The Bible says we are led by the Spirit of the living God. We now have the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that guides us. So I don't need a law that says don't commit adultery. The Spirit of the living God tells me not to do that or lie or steal. It, and it tells me, honor the Lord my God with all that I have and I am. So to post rules and regulations and create memberships to which people can belong if they keep them and then keep, kick people out because they don't keep them is, is simply, basically, legalism which has nothing to do with the Christian church. And I'm sorry to say that uh, many of our very fundamental churches, and I will say it again, especially Pentecostal churches, got caught up in legalism. I grew up in horrible legalism. We had all kinds of rules, and if you didn't keep the rules, they kicked you out. And the rules weren't even biblical. Do you hear what I'm telling you? There was nothing in Scripture that even uh, warranted that kind of requirement. But as a little boy, I remember people being turned out of the church because they broke one of the rules. Now, I'm, I'm going to stray just a moment here in case we have somebody that hasn't heard this story. I want to tell it again. Uh, when I was in the fourth grade, my mother contracted uh, breast cancer. And in those days, they didn't have much treatment at all. All they did knew to do was just cut everything out and cut everything off. 
My mother almost died. She was in uh, intensive care for a long time. When she did come home, she couldn't hold her left arm up very high. She could do this. And we watched her cry all the time because of the pain. Well, we belonged to an old-fashioned Pentecostal church, and the women had to have very long hair. You couldn't cut your hair. But they found a way to get around that, so they would put it up on their head. You know, the big French beehive. Yeah. So one day, my dad came in, a godly man, and he said to my mother, get your sweater. I am taking you to the beauty salon. We watched her try to fix her hair, you know, and put it. He took her to the beauty salon, and they cut it short enough <coughs> that she could manage it. We got to church that Sunday, and the minister got up, and he said, before we begin the service today, we have an item of church business to take care of. Sister Livingston has broken one of our teachings. She has cut her hair, and the teachings specifically forbid women cutting their hair and I'm going to ask her to come up and apologize to you and apologize to God for breaking the rules and for bringing a reproach on our God. And I was on the front row, Dennis was on the second, and we were both sitting there crying. I watched my mother get up, holding her arm, and she walked up on the stage, and she had tears trickling down her cheek. And she said, well, I am so sorry if I have offended any of you. And I certainly didn't want to offend the Lord. I love the Lord, and I'm just really sorry. And I sat there as a, a young man, and I'm not going to tell you the word that I said because it was a curse word. And I said as I turned around, I hate every one of you blank people. And my mother and daddy stayed with that church. You remember that time, Gwendolyn? Yeah, yeah. I can tell you the pastor that made her do it, too. So that's what I call legalism, and God's not within 100 miles of that kind of foolishness. That is, that's, that's worse. It's not worse. It's the same as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I could just go on and on. Now, if someone could help me get back on track here, what are, am I talking about? <laughs> that we grew up in that. That's what I'm trying to say. And, and you guys, some of you who've come from Slavic churches, Pentecostal Slavic churches, know what I'm talking about. They are still very mean people in those churches. We still have some really mean people in this denomination and in many Pentecostal denominations. We grew up in that crap. Yeah. Well, and, 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 it, and you did too. And it scarred us. It scarred us deeply because we were always afraid. You know, if we read in the Bible that we were free to do thus and so, but the church said we couldn't, we didn't know what to do. But thanks be to God. The Holy Spirit opened the Scriptures, and we saw that our life is now in the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ and not in the letter of any law anywhere. Amen. Amen. Okay, so after that, this just happened to be the next question, very short. Should Christians drink an occasional glass of wine? Should they? It says should they. Not can they. It says should. Well, I'm not going to say you should. <laughs> should. Um... Let me read what the scriptures say. You know, you're beating a dead horse with this. Here's what the scriptures say. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That's what the Bible says. I cannot stand here and tell you that it is a sin to have a glass of wine with your meal. I can't, and I won't do, I won't say what the Scriptures don't say. And then people get into an argument about the potency of wine today versus the wine in Jesus' day. Uh, folks, the wine they drank in Jesus' day made you happy. 
do you think those people were that disappointed at the first wedding in Cana that they had run out of grape juice? No. And I know, you know, the Proverbs say, uh, uh, wine makes a man's heart glad, and we were created to enjoy all of the blessings of God and wine that makes the heart glad. And th then another proverb says, uh, uh, he that looks, wine, wine, is, wine is a mocker and strong drink, something else, and whoever is deceived is not wise. Well, don't be deceived. If you drink too much, you lose control. What bothers me is the hypocrisy of our society. Because Sunday in the, in the Panther Stadium, there will be untold thousands of gallons of alcohol consumed, and guess what? They'll leave that game and get in cars and drive down highways. That makes me angry, that they will not say anything about, about the danger of it. Oh, they'll say, drink responsibly, please. But they're making money. And see, any time money's involved, people just kind of wink and turn the other way. So I can't sit here or stand here and tell anybody that to have a glass of wine with your meal is a sin. You have to follow your own conscience and your own leading. The only thing the Bible condemns is drunkenness. Drunkenness. And it, cond it also condemns overeating. It condemns anything that controls you, anything that harms you, anything you overdo. So keep all that in mind, and we have to keep it in perspective as well. Did I answer that question okay? Yes. All right. Uh, you touched on this somewhat before. Uh, this lady writes in, some believe Christians are the Israelites who are the true Israelites. Who are the true Israelites? Okay. Let me go backwards. The true Israelites are over there in Israel. Okay. The, the Israelites have been spread all over the world. You've got different groups of Jews slash Israelites everywhere. The greatest, the biggest group of Israelites are the Ashkenazi. And they're the ones that migrated north up into the Slavic uh, countries. I want to say Poland, Hungary, even Germany, France. Then you have the Sephardic Jewish people who are mainly from Spain. And I've, I'd have friends from both groups. And what's funny is they don't want you to get them mixed up. This is amazing to me. Everybody wants to be who they are, and don't you get them mixed up with anybody else. Tribes and colors. I don't know, where was I the other day? I said something to one of, one of the young ladies here at church. I said, yeah, you're from Latvia. She said, what? I'm from Moldova. I said, okay. I don't, I didn't, I don't even know where they are. But that's how strong people are about, you know, Russians, Ukrainians, Moldovans, Latvians. Then you go to South America. They don't want to be associated with these people. Light-colored people don't want to be with dark-colored people. It just get, I don't know. So here's the deal. <clears throat> there are movements that declare that they are the true Israelites. You've got the British Israelism, where they believe that British People, which also includes the United States, since that's where we came from, are the true Israelites. Then you have black Israelites, or black Hebrews, who believe that only black people are the true Israelites. Then you have, I wrote this, uh, this down, the gathering of Christ. That's another movement, the gathering of Christ which says <clears throat> that blacks, Hispanics, and Pacific Islanders 
are the true Israelites. So I don't know what group you belong to. <laughs> but here's what I feel. And people are saying, you know, nobody knows who, the, who what tribe they belong to anyway. It's been so long. They don't know if they belong to the tribe of uh, <clears throat> Asher or whoever. Folks, it doesn't matter what we don't know. God knows who he chose. God knows the DNA and everybody. And just a few weeks ago, we studied Revelation. And there are 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 from each tribe. Now, if it's in God's word, God knows who the tribes are. And for us to want to be one just because, I don't know why, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. Or to try to, to relegate certain groups of people or certain colors of people to true Israelites makes no sense. Now, here's another question. Who are true Jews? Want me to go there? Um, Romans 2.28, I'm, I'm going to flip over here and see if I can find it relatively quickly. We're not talking about the same thing now. Who are the true Israelites? Uh, Paul had this really big discussion with the Romans about who true Jews are. Here's what he said. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is... <coughs> nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. Paul says with quite a degree of emphasis, true Jews are those who have the faith of Abraham not just fleshly descendants of Abraham only, but those who have the faith of Abraham, faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ. So you can get into all kinds of aspects of this stuff. I'm just glad that I'm simple-minded enough to be thankful that I'm in the church. And in the church, there are Jews and there are Gentiles. And we've become one in Christ Jesus. I'm in the church. That's all I care about. I'm not trying to find out if I belong to... I don't even care what I, where I came from. I don't know why in the world people will spend $150 and order one of these kits to try to find out where you came from. I can tell you where you came from. His name was Adam. Her name was Eve. And they messed up. And you're exactly like them. Except the last Adam interrupted the program. And he came in and gave us a new spirit, a new heart, and a new mind. I don't know. I, people say, what is your lineage? Or is it lineage? No, what is your heritage? Well, I, my, I had an old uncle across town years and years ago said that his, call him Pappy. His Pappy came over here on the boat from Scotland. I said, so am I a Scots person? Am I Scottish? He said, with great enthusiasm, I, I reckon you are. <laughs> I reckon you are. He didn't care. I don't care. What, what have I got to do with way back then? How, how does that affect me now? Knowing what little village my ancestors grew up in in Scotland, what's that got to do with me now? I'm a new creation. I'm on my way to heaven. What was then is, was then and who, whoever they were, I, I'm not a part of them. So I'm happy to be saved. I'm just getting all wound up. I shouldn't be. Now, don't, now, come on. Don't come up after church and say, man, 
Man, come on, man. It just helps to know where you came from. Why? Why does that help to know where you came from? I just told you where you came from. There is none righteous, no, not one. In Adam all die, but in Christ all shall be made alive. Amen. It, they'll still do it anyway, and you know it won't. My sister will get emails in the morning. You know that. They're probably sending them now. Probably sending them now. Yeah, I can see you back there. <laughs> Here's the bottom line. I just aggravate a lot of people. My attitude does. They think I'm arrogant. I'm a know-it-all. Everything I say is wrong. I lean this way politically or I lean that way politically. And they can read between the lines. <laughs> they know what I really am. Another question? Sure. <laughs> Maybe we'll read a scripture. Leah, you, <laughs> I'm serious. I didn't, I didn't plan to do all this. Uh, Leah, do you have Matthew 18, 18? <laughs> Let's read that together, everybody. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. So the question is, uh, yeah, you can say that, and whatever you loose on earth <laughs> yes. will be loosed in heaven, the full scripture. So what does that mean? Is it for all believers, or was that for Peter specifically? Okay, I believe, first of all, it was for Peter specifically. He was telling Peter and the, and the disciples, uh, you're, you're the head of the church. You're the beginning of the church, not the Catholic church, my church. And I've given you apostolic authority. And when you sit and meet and pray and seek me, whatever you bind, I've already bound in heaven. I'm not doing it in heaven after you do it down here. In your prayers and in your seeking of me, when you make decisions, I've already made that decision. I'm just letting you work out my decision. Okay? Does that make sense? So we don't go around saying, I bind you, devil. Do we? Of course not. When did he get loose? He was at my house this, today. <laughs> and somebody here bound him Sunday. I, I just wonder, how did he get loose? <laughs> I bind you in the name of Jesus. Really? Only Jesus can do that. And he will do it one of these days, and he's going to throw, his, throw him in the uh, lake of fire. So I, I do think that that is a suitable explanation for me, that it was for them. But I also think that that still continues, that when we seek God's face, even in the church leadership here, when we seek the face of the Lord, the Lord guides us. We don't do it first. We're just discovering what he's already done in heaven. The church also has authority to uh, excommunicate people. When they sin willfully and deliberately and uh, frequently and rebellious, rebelliously, <laughs> uh, the church, Paul gave the church the authority to excommunicate. So, there's a lot that goes on in the church, in the affairs of the church. This is God's body on earth, see, and he's guiding it from heaven. And the only way we can make sure we stay in his will is to pray and know his word and be humble before him. We've made some errors in this church. I have in leadership. I've made some er errors. Uh, uh, and it, they, it grinds me, and I wonder how I could have missed it. But I have to trust that God somewhere up there knows what's going on, and he's in charge, and he guides and somehow meshes everything together. I hope that was a sufficient answer. I really do. Another question about a specific scripture. Please explain chosen from before the foundations of the earth? If so, why is John 3.16 in the Bible? 
also as Christians, does God give us free will? Yes. Gives us free will. That's why uh, uh, Joshua said, choose, you choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You come to the New Testament, and he says, whosoever will. Whosoever calls on the, <clears throat> on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That doesn't sound like God has uh, taken free will away from mankind or, or never gave it to mankind. Uh, on the other hand, we, we have it there. It's uh, uh, chosen in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the earth. If, if that's true, why is John 3.16 in the Bible? I don't know. See, there are some, some things seem to be contradictory, but they are not. And this would be a good time for me to read this verse of Scripture. I almost read it the last two Wednesday nights, but I didn't. Maybe this will work tonight. And it uh, goes uh, something like this. Oh, listen, listen. You know, if you're trying to understand God, listen to this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, exclamation point. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, another exclamation point. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has first given to him and it shall be given back to him. For of him, through him, to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I cannot answer those questions to satisfy everybody. All I know is both scriptures are in the Bible, so both scriptures are true. All right? Well, then let's go, let's go to this one uh, in reference to the message Sunday. My question is, what if a so-called believer willfully leaves God's hands? So you heard the message Sunday about hands. We're in Christ, and then God the Father's hands are on our hands. It's there, isn't it? I mean, it's there. You read it. I read it to you. So you're not going to find a scripture anywhere else that contradicts that because scriptures don't contradict scriptures. They all flow together. And so you have to, instead of just looking at one, you have to start, how, how can I say this? It's a sculptor. It's, you put it all together. It's a weaving of truth. So here's what it said Sunday. My sheep know my voice. Did you know it's the same thing as my sheep know my word? And they won't follow another. They follow me and they know my word. So the example here that was given because of that, what if a so-called believer willfully leaves God's hands? And here's the reason. My father left my mother after 38 years of marriage for another woman, yet he says he never departed from faith in Jesus. How can I make any sense of that? Well, you may have made a lot of sense when you asked the question, what if a so-called believer? So-called. Because lots of people imitate Christianity without knowing Christ. That's why you have the wheat and tares parable that Jesus gave. And people can act that way for a long time. Why don't, we, why don't I just tell you in 1 John 2.19 
what John said about this kind of business. Uh, listen, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Now listen to this verse. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So sometimes people can imitate Christianity and then something like this happens and they say, well, I still love Jesus. Well, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't keep my commandments, you don't love me. If you keep my commandments, you not only love me, you love my Father, and my Father loves you. So there is something to that so-called believer thing. Now, are there people like that in this church? Sure. Absolutely. And over the 45 years, I've seen that very thing happen. People work in ministry, very deeply involved in ministry in this church, and then something just snaps. They find another woman or a man or uh, start, I don't know, do all kinds of stuff, and they're gone. Well, I thought they were saved. I don't know. That's why I said last week when we get to heaven, we're going to be shocked at who is there and who isn't there. But I don't know. You know, I know Jesus said you'll know them by the fruit that they bear. So I, I can't adequately answer she or whoever this is, how can I make any sense of that? I can't make sense of it. I don't know how you can sit in a spirit-filled church and hear spirit-filled Bible preaching and teaching and be involved in ministry. And even, I've watched this, and even lead people to the Lord in the altar. And now, living like hell. And been doing it for years and years. Not just a hiccup. No, they're just gone. I can't make any sense of that except to say, uh, these are the last days, and this is church. And there are all kinds of people in church, all kinds. And I'm glad the Lord's in charge, and all I'm to do and all you are to do is serve him. Serve him. Is that it? Do, may, if, I, I can't see the clock, but if I could just do this one more time about this uh, binding and loosing thing. They're really big about this in uh, the Word of Faith movement, you know, Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis. What other false line prophets are there could I name? Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Hagen. Kenneth, oh my, Kenneth Hagen. Uh, who? Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar. Oh, I could call a bunch of names, and, and, and some of you would leave mad. You say, well, why do you watch that? So I can know what you are listening to. And I can, when I have conversations with people, I go, uh-oh, they've been listening to Joyce. Somebody emailed me not long ago and said, what in the world is wrong with Joyce Meyer? She really helped me in a, t in a difficult time. Well, uh, she's word of faith. She's one of the ones that said the devil and all his demons grabbed hold of Jesus, jerked him down to hell and stood on him and stomped on him and laughed at him and spit on him and humiliated him. I heard her tell it. That never happened. Satan has never had authority over the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus went down into the lower parts of the earth, he was still the Son of God and the creator of the universe. So, you know, you better check out who you're listening to. They may sound good. You may love the way they present whatever they present. You, and you call that anointing. It's funny how... Uh, it's funny to me how people think of somebody's uh, going at it 
and spitting and a hollering and quoting and just won't stop. My God, he's anointed. That's not the anointing. The anointing is when the gospel actually changes somebody's heart. You know, I can, get, I can stand up there and entertain. And, and people say, that was so good. That really helped me tonight. But it can also be empty. It can be words only. It's the spirit that quickens the flesh, profits, nothing. And there's a lot of people filling up a lot of convention centers and big churches just listening to flesh. You know why? Because they're in the flesh. Flesh hungers for flesh. Flesh hates spirit, and spirit hates flesh. But if flesh has got it going on, more flesh will come and join it. I probably ought to stop right now. But the point was, they do a lot of this binding and loosing. Kenneth Copeland, when COVID first came out, he bound a COVID-19. I watched him do it. On the screen, somebody showed you. Say, hey, Pastor, have you seen this? I bind you. Well, let me tell you something. Satan does not fear you one bit. He laughs at you when you try to boss him around. But when you say in the name of Jesus... And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have to say anything. And when you walk in obedience, the most powerful life and the greatest prayer is when a man obeys Holy Scripture. It's when somebody is hurt, but they forgive anyway, walls come tumbling down. Now, that's the anointing, and that's the power of Jesus but for us to scoot around and say, I bind you, devil. I bind you, devil. I bind you. I loose you. I loose you. I loose the spirit of prosperity. And now several of them have claimed that they have a financial anointing. Which means, if you will send here to me, uh, this anointing that I have will go into your seed and you will prosper. And, I, and you've, you've seen all that, so I, I don't want to give it any more time. But I would simply, as I've done all these years, tell you this. If you read and you pray, you're safe. The Holy Spirit will teach you. That's why he said, you, you don't need any man to teach you. You have the Holy Spirit. And when you pray and prayerfully study, that's the greatest enlightening you can have because the Holy Spirit will open up your eyes of understanding. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, we've done all the questions for tonight. I hope nobody misunderstood anything. I'm pretty sure you did. I'm pretty sure you did. But... Uh, yeah, Lord. <laughs> really, we're laughing, but this is really important. Father, I ask that you will let our desire to understand, this desire to know, that's why people write questions, that's why they ask questions, because there's something about you that interests us. Your word is so fascinating your miraculous deeds and your ways just make our mouths fall wide open with it in awe. We're hungry to know more about you, Jesus. But teach us your ways and open up your word, not so we can just know something, but that we might serve you better and live out the word of God. In your mighty holy name we pray. Amen. If you don't mind, stand. Who wants to sing a solo? All right, bye. I love you, church, and I'll see you Sunday unless...
Jesus comes.